uh, John Harris is a professor of international studies at Simon Fraser University, Vancouver. He's also been a visiting researcher at uh, the Madras Institute of Development Studies and has published extensively on aspects of Indian political economy. Today, he will be talking to us about uh, aspiration, opportunity, mobility, the prospects uh, for development among India's youth. I would also like to introduce you uh, to Professor Sudhanshu Bhushan from NEPA. Uh, Professor Bhushan specializes in internationalization of higher education, policy issues in higher education and education planning. He's a co-editor of uh, a book uh, titled Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in India and Australia, which has been published by uh, Rutledge. He's also the recipient of the Amartasen Award 2012 uh, for Distinguished Social Scientist. Uh, an award which is uh, given by the in uh, Indian Council of Social Science uh, Research uh, in New Delhi. I would like to thank you. Thank you. I invite you. All right. Thank you. Is it okay if I stand up? Um, is this too, uh, too threatening to didactic? Oh, that hasn't, uh, that's fallen off. I mean, I have a, I have a, uh, a talk prepared, um, and yesterday, uh, questions which bugged me through the day seemed to tie up quite closely uh, with the talk that I prepared a few days ago, because I guess what was bugging me yesterday a little bit, with going back to the very first session, you know, uh, and then, you know, Satak talking with you afterwards, um, about such exciting developments uh, in higher education, uh, in, in this institution, or in Sartax, the University of uh, Ahmedabad. But what was bugging me uh, was the question of, of access. Fantastic stuff that you guys are doing in your university. But you know, who has access to that? This wonderful place, but for 1,500 students, and at the moment anyway, and who, ha who has access to this? Because I, I guess I've been very fairly fundamentally concerned with, uh, in different ways, with inequality, and class, in class inequality uh, throughout, uh, throughout my life. Um, and my talk is very much about the reproduction of, of inequality and what I see as the, the kind of wall that so many people in this country, and it's not exclusive to India by any means, confront. But some parts of the discussions yesterday, and even more the first session this morning, has kind of disturbed me a little bit. <laughs> and I always want to throw this away and start again, but I, but I can't. Because I think what I've realized, and it's perhaps just showing my own lack of intelligence, naivete. I, I, I think perhaps, you know, I do have in, in my thinking a rather, somewhere underlying my thinking, a rather kind of conventional model of social mobility. Social mobility, uh, in some sense, mediated, partly at least, through education uh, and advancement of the kind that uh, has happened in my own family, as I shall be as I shall be talking about. What I think uh, came through to me so strongly in the discussions earlier this morning um, uh, and in some of the discussion yesterday was really the recognition that um, you know, I should question, I should be questioning my rather conventional sort of understanding of, of mobility and my rather conventional thinking about aspiration. Because it seemed to me that there are, there are so many groups of, of young people in this country who know very well that they're never actually going to be able to make it through that sort of conventional, those conventional avenues of upward mobility that I'm talking about and that I've, that I've, had, in, that I've had in mind. Uh, and that there are very different, different aspirations. Perhaps it's a little bit, you know, to be sort of self-critical. When, uh, uh, Shailendra, you were talking yesterday morning about uh, the, the young people you've been working with 
you know, being exposed to Western culture in an, an art center. As I said, I, I thought of them, you know, looking at pictures of Rembrandt, you know, and that was, of course, not at all what they were, what they were doing. So I've begun with a kind of mea culpa, but now I'll have to go back to, uh, to uh, what I had prepared. Um, and, you know, in, I, I'll be touching in some way on, uh, on quite a lot of what's been said already, perhaps particularly uh, on uh, Divya's talk from, from yesterday. The subject of the conference, Urban Transformations, Youth Aspirations and Education, set me thinking on these lines. What do urban transformations taking place in India which I believe are setting the metropolitan cities further apart from the rest of society, even the smaller cities, in terms of overall wealth, but at the same time are bringing about more and more significant patterns of exclusion. What do these transformations uh, mean for the prospects uh, of, of young people? What does greatly increased inequality within the big cities and in urban India more generally, and the increased inequality between metropolitan cities and the smaller cities and towns and between them and the villages connote for young people's aspirations. And I was just saying something about that in my pre preliminary of unscripted remarks. How are young people's prospects for realizing their aspirations affected by the progress that has been made, at least in terms of enrollments and the quality of educational infrastructure in the country over the last decade or so. As well as these fairly obvious questions, the subject of the conference uh, has put me in mind as well of my experience of involvement in research early in 2014 in Delhi with Divya and colleagues. I'm talking a little bit about the research that Divya was referring to yesterday, but in Tamil Nadu and in Bihar as well, uh, on youth and politics. I participated then in some interviews and in focus group discussions in both Delhi and Tamil Nadu, and I recall the enthusiasm with which so many young people regarded the then candidate Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Modi, because they were convinced by his uh, promises to deliver opportunity. As we know, the Modi government signally failed to deliver, according to most authorities, certainly on promises of creating many more good jobs. How are the youth of this country reacting to this, to this failure? So the subject of the conference reminded me as well of a statement made by uh, Jawaharlal Nehru in closing the debate on the aims and objects in the Constituent Assembly on January the 22nd, 1947, when he said it was the responsibility of the members not only, quote him, to free India through, the new, through a new constitution, but he said to feed the starving people, to clothe the naked masses, and to give every Indian the fullest opportunity to develop himself according to his capacity. I've always found this a remarkable uh, statement, anticipating, as it seems to me to do, Amartya Sen's writing much later about his understanding of development in terms of the expansion of people's capabilities and ultimately their capacities to live lives that they have reason to value. This, I believe, is an elaboration of the idea of people, every Indian, having the fullest opportunity to develop herself according to her capacity. Martha Nuss Nussbaum's gloss on this thinking emphasizes the ability to engage in what she calls reflexive life planning. This means being able to think logically about our goals and aspirations and the means of achieving them, recognizing but not being chained by the constraints to which we're subject, so as to be able to lead good lives, 
that we have reason to value. Now, we in this room are all people who are able to engage in such reflexive life planning. But how far is this true of very many of our youth? So how far has Nehru's idea of the purpose of the new India being to ensure that every Indian should have the fullest opportunity to develop himself according to his capacity been realized? These arguments also tie up for me very closely with those of Arjun Apadure, who writes about the capacity to aspire. It is, he says, a cultural capacity, but not one which is equally distributed across society. Relative poverty, he argues, means having fewer and more limited aspirations and a thinner and a weaker sense of the pathways towards their achievement. We who are more fortunate have, in a sense, had more opportunity to develop the capacity to aspire. We've had more practice at it. And Apodore suggests, I quote him, that in, that in strengthening the capacity to aspire, especially among the poor, the future-oriented logic of development could find a natural ally, and the poor could find the resources required to contest and alter the conditions of their poverty. He goes on, as many of you will remember, to argue from his experience of working in Mumbai with the alliance of the NGO Spark, uh, the movement, the National uh, uh, Slum Dwellers Foundation, and Mahila Milan over housing problems, that strengthening the capacity of the poor to exercise voice and to debate and oppose norms that are imposed upon them is an important means of strengthening the capacity to aspire. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm wanting to, uh, you know, to apply those ideas, that kind of thinking, you know, to, to young people, young people uh, in, uh, in general uh, in, uh, in this country. All of these preliminary reflections have actually led me to want to discuss social mobility in India. But to begin with, I'd like to say something about my own personal experience and that of the United Kingdom in order to make what are, I think, some important, sort of more general and partly theoretical points. I'm actually a very privileged person because of the generation uh, into which I was born in the United Kingdom. I don't come from a privileged background. My maternal grandfather, born in 1883, went to work half-time in a coal mine aged nine, the existing legislation uh, about you know, uh, child labor notwithstanding. My mother, a highly intelligent woman, had to leave school aged 14 after her elementary education and she worked as, as a shop assistant. My dad, when I was a kid, was a garage mechanic. But thanks to a, a very good public education system, I was able to go to a reasonably good university and to become a professional person. Mine is actually an instance of quite steep intergenerational uh, upward social mobility. But then I was fortunate enough to have been part uh, of what the, uh, 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 Britain's most eminent empirical sociologist, John Goldthorpe, describes as the golden age of social mobility in the post-war period uh, in the UK, when there was, in his terms, an upgrading of the class structure of the country. What he means by that is that there was a marked increase in the proportion of better jobs. The proportion of salaried positions increased, and that of wage-earning, working-class positions declined. I and many of my generation benefited, therefore, from the change that took place in the structure of our society. It wasn't that edu the educational opportunities 
that we'd had or our own abilities didn't play a part. But they wouldn't have counted for so much had it not been for the structural change that took place in the economy and society. And after the Golden Age, the upgrading of the class structure slowed down and relatively fewer of the better jobs were created. Now, of course, there's a marked duality in the labor force in the time of the, yes, the gig economy, in which a significant share of those in some form of employment is made up by independent workers who are paid by the task or the project, the gig, in other words, as opposed to those conventional workers or employees who receive a salary or an hourly wage. While a significant research shows that a significant proportion of such independent workers, in the UK anyway, have fairly substantial incomes, they do pretty well, the conditions under which even they work are usually precarious, and many more gig workers lead lives on a shoestring, while of course facilitating capital accumulation. Meanwhile, in our society, uh, there's another fraction of the labor force uh, which is highly remunerated, in highly remunerated professional positions in the UK, mostly in finance and other services. In this context of pronounced duality, more and more people are actually at risk of downward mobility, as has been the experience of many of the children of my own peers. The key point is that the more people there are who are starting out from a higher position in society, the more people are actually at risk of falling. Social mobility is a zero-sum game, except in circumstances like those in which I grew up, in which there are increasing numbers of the better jobs in society. There's quite a mythology, I think, about, about social mobility. No? Uh, I think of the, the mythology of uh, the United States, you know, characterized by tremendous levels of social mobility by comparison uh, with the old countries in, in Western Europe. The empirical evidence shows it's, it's largely, largely nonsense. Um, and I think a lot of the, the reason for the nonsense is comes back to this, to this point that I've just made about social mobility being a zero-sum game, except in, cons in those circumstances uh, in which the overall structure of society, economy and society is changing in such a way as to increase the numbers of better jobs. So social mobility is generally thought of in terms of upward mobility and it's highly valued. It is, I guess, in some way, an underlying presumption, perhaps, I don't know, Manisha, an underlying presumption of this conference. But for upward mobility uh, to be realized, there have to be more of the better jobs and or less hoarding of the opportunities to get the better jobs. And in Britain, the odds are still stacked very heavily in favor of the advantaged, which means, in effect, the hoarding of opportunities. Education in itself, uh, of itself, is not an adequate answer to the problem of improving equality of opportunity. For one thing, a more qualified workforce doesn't of itself upgrade the class structure, and it may just mean an overqualified workforce. And education, of course, is actually a positional good. Educational expansion has had no impact on the more advantaged parents' capacities to secure for their children a higher place in the queue by getting them into the better schools. Education is, of course, a means of maintaining the class structure which is exactly what Craig, Jeffrey, Roger, and Patricia Jeffrey uh, argued in their by now classic work, Degrees Without Freedom, question mark, 
based on field research in Western UP. The question mark in the title of the book, of course, reflects the author's questioning of the idea that education enhances people's chances of exercising greater freedom in the sense of having more control over their lives and exercising more choice. The idea of jobs being allocated meritocratically is, of course, attractive. Divya, too, ended or spoke a little bit yesterday about the concept of, uh, of merit. But the focus on equality of opportunity neglects the fact that parents' positions are their children's starting points. The reproduction uh, of social inequality happens more or less automatically. An important part of this is the cultural capital that's performed by children from advantaged backgrounds and the social networks that they're able to access. Their abilities to schmooze, to, forgive me if it's slightly coarse, to bullshit, to talk convincingly on subjects on which they are ill uh, or misinformed can make a big difference to their opportunities. A notable exemplar of how, the, of how far the capacity to talk convincingly, convincingly on subjects about which he really knows very little and to win a high position in society is, of course, the current Prime Minister uh, of the United Kingdom. <laughs> the point that I'm making, the serious point, is that merit is a very problematic category. What is taken as merit is very often, very largely, a reflection of the parent's position, the child's starting point. So how do these ideas, um, have I run out of my time yet? I'm not being thrown as, oh. uh, so I, I, let me speed up. How do these ideas, which I've illustrated with reference to the British experience, work out in the Indian context? And I want to examine some of the results of research on social mobility in this country. And a starting point for me is indeed with the work carried out in 2014 uh, by Divya uh, with Arshad Alam and Surinder Jodka uh, in, in the uh, Delhi study that I mentioned earlier and that Divya spoke a little bit about yesterday. And I'm repeating one or two of the things that, uh, uh, that, that she said. The study brought out very clearly the reproduction of inequality. Contrary to the expectations which were being expressed by a good many observers at that time, um, that historic lines of social inequality and difference were being shaken up by education. With the increasing numbers, notably of engineering colleges and business schools in the country, surely important changes uh, are taking place in society. These were the sorts of ideas that we were encouraged to address uh, in, uh, in, in our research. The argument that there are more opportunities being opened up for aspiring youth that will bring about social churning. What the Delhi research showed, however, and it seems to me there's nothing remotely surprising about it, was that more highly educated parents are more likely to fund their children's education and that their children are more likely to have studied in English medium. Not surprising either that there should be a clear relationship between the financial positions of their families and the extent to which children, kids, Youth are able to exercise individual choice. The research showed two, Divya referred to this, a nearly linear relationship between parental education and competitive placement in, in a job. On the other hand, uh, the children of those parents who had little education themselves, not in English medium, but especially those who are Muslims, or scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, were found to have been more reliant on influence, 
or on the payment of something in securing employment, and also to have had to wait longest before getting into a, a job. These findings are broadly in line with those of a number of other studies drawing on data pertaining to the country as a whole. One of the earlier studies was uh, by Sanjay um, years ago. Uh, you've probably almost forgotten it yourself. <laughs> Working with uh, Anthony and Oliver Heath based on cross-section data from the National Election Survey of uh, 1996 was paper two papers actually published in EPW in 2004, I think it was. Um, so the researchers distinguished eight different occupational categories from the higher salariat of executives, professionals, and white collar employees through to lower agriculturalists, by which they meant small farmers, agricultural laborers, and those in other agriculture related occupations. So Sanjay and his co-authors found that there was more of an inflow into the salariat than into other occupations. And from a diversity of backgrounds, with the biggest single contingent, unsurprisingly, given its very large share in the labor force as a whole, from among the lower agriculturalists. This finding, they thought, showed that there was indeed a sense in which India could be seen as a land of opportunity. You know, most mobility into the, salar into the salariat and from people from a, uh, a, the, the, the bottom of the, of the pile. On the other hand, they found that 67% of sons remained in the same occupation as their fathers and that viewed in that way, there was obviously a great deal of class continuity. And there's also, they found, very substantial class inequality. The sons of fathers in the salariat have about 20 times the chance of getting into the salariat themselves than did the sons of unskilled uh, manual workers. Um, more findings of that kind, but the further point that I think I want to make with reference to that study is that just as work on social mobility in Britain shows up the crucial importance of the changing class structure of society, so did this study. Uh, the authors found rather more upward than downward mobility and showed that this followed in large part, though not entirely, from change in the occupational structure, the existence, as they put it, of more room, uh, of more room at the top. There's a more recent study by Vegard Iverson and uh, Anirudh Krishna and Kunal Sen which uses data from the Human Development Survey of 2011-12 that comes up with quite comparable findings, uh, obviously with that more recent data. These authors find that the proportion of sons following the occupations of their fathers is less than in the older study, but there's still considerable class continuity and upwards and downward movements more or less balance each other out exactly as uh, I would expect. The finding that there's higher uh, occupational mobility among forward castes than among the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes is comparable with the findings of Sanjay's earlier study. And Everson and co. Uh, find uh, as well that there's a much higher prevalence of very sharp descents going downwards among sons of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe fathers. Last study I'm going to refer to, perhaps the most authoritative, but I, I stand to be corrected by, uh, by Divya, who's so much more expert on all of this stuff than I can possibly be. Perhaps the single most authoritative study of intergenerational mobility is that by Bhumeshwar Reddy, based on evidence uh, from NSS unemployment, employment and unemployment surveys over the period from 1983 to 2012. Their study, this study too, shows a high degree of immobility with between 70 and 80% of sons following the same occupations as their fathers, according to survey findings across the whole 25 year period. <clears throat> 
But Reddy's most striking finding is that mobility actually seems to have decreased, to have fallen between 1983 and 2012. For sure, the raw data show a bit of an increase in mobility, but he demonstrates that the incre this increase is a result of changes in the occupational structure. So comparable, at least in a limited way, with what happened in Britain in the period after the war. Once the occupational structure of 2012 is adjusted statistically to match that of 1983, then the mobility rate is actually shown to have declined uh, by a few percentage points. And the association between fathers and sons' occupations is actually higher in 2012 than it was in 1983. Between 1983 and 2012, the magnitude of upward mobility from unskilled occupations to any other, uh, any other occupation declined. And as in the findings of uh, other research, this study too shows up the disadvantage of men from the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Their downward mobility uh, was higher and upward mobility lower by comparison with men uh, from, uh, from other, other castes. I'll cut out a bit. Reddy's conclusion is that the fall in social mobility alongside a rise in inequality is in, is in accordance with the negative correlation between inequality and mobility observed uh, in the context uh, of uh, developed countries. Um, right. So in sum, uh, the burden of the evidence from large-scale statistical studies of social mobility in India is firstly that overall mobility is very restricted, that such mobility as has occurred is mostly due to change in the over, overall class or occupational structure, which means mainly in this case the movement of labor out of agriculture. Secondly, there is little, if any, evidence to suggest that social mobility has increased alongside India's booming economic growth, but rather the reverse, that high growth and the increased inequality that, is, that it has brought about is associated with declining mobility. Thirdly, class inequality is very strong. Or, you know, going back to the terms that I was using earlier, there's very considerable hoarding of opportunity by the ad already advantaged. And the fourth key observation, it seems to me, is that the disadvantage of those from scheduled caste, scheduled tribe backgrounds is very marked. They are much less likely than others to experience upward mobility, and they're very much more likely to experience steep descents. Now, when I spoke about my own experience in Britain, I referred to the idea of a golden age for social mobility that happened in the years after the Second World War. That's when there was the, this upgrading of the class structure, as John Goldthorpe puts it. Such a change, it seems, it seems to me, is precisely not what has happened uh, in this country, in spite of very high rates of economic growth. And this is because of the pronounced dualism uh, that marks the Indian economy. That is aptly summed up, I think, by Anirudh Krishna uh, and Jan Nirvian uh, Petersi when they describe India as having both a dollar economy and a rupee economy. What they're referring to is the experience that most of us have had, I think, uh, of the existence, in effect, of two worlds. Um, I think I read this, this work uh, at a time when I was doing field work in, in Tamil Nadu. My daughter was there, and I remember taking her to dinner in the Park Hotel. We had lovely dinners, drank nice wine, and I paid more or less the same that I would pay in Vancouver or Toronto or London. And then I was doing field work in Virupuram, which some of you may know, uh, you know, Mofasal town in Tamil Nadu. You know, you, you couldn't spend more than 
you know, well, at that, at that time, I suppose, about 150 rupees on a, on a dinner. And what a damn good dinner you could get for 150 rupees. Not the same sort of dinner as the one you had in the Park Hotel, but my God, it was good. Um, you know, and you pay for a cup of coffee uh, in so many places in posh parts of this city or others. Pay more or less the same for a cup of coffee as you do in, in, in Toronto. And we all know, you know, or a cup of tea, depending on which part of the country you're in. You can go out into the street uh, and, and buy a very good cup of coffee, cup of tea for uh, very, very little by comparison. Dollar economy, rupee economy. These worlds are very much apart. The existence of these two economies is a reflection of the way in which the economy has grown, which is such as to have seen a very sharp increase in inequality. The definitive research on this, I think, is by uh, Chancel and Piketty uh, from Paris uh, on change in income inequality over the period from 1922 uh, to 2015, which shows that the top 1% of earners accounted for only 6% of total income in the early 1980s, but for 22% now. And while the incomes of the bottom 50% increased uh, by more than the average over the period from 1950 to 1981, this was reversed in the subsequent period from 1980 to 2015. And over this period, 1980 to 2015, the top 0.1% captured a higher share of the total income than the bottom 50%. Only a very small share of the population of India lives in the dollar economy, no matter how much that dollar economy is in our faces. You know, in Ahmedabad or in Chennai or Delhi or wherever, any one other of the, the, the metros. Given the dualistic pattern of economic growth that's taken place, the rate at which overall employment has increased has declined steadily. And since 2011-12, uh, as Kannan and Ravindran have shown, India has actually experienced, as they say, job loss growth, not job less, uh, job loss growth, with not just an increased rate of unemployment, but also a fall in the numbers of workers. And as you well know, as people have moved out of agriculture, they've taken up jobs primarily in construction, and a large share of the remainder of the jobs taken up have been in traditional services. As one of the leading economists conclude, net in increases in employment have occurred almost exclusively in the least productive unorganized part of the economy. There's been virtually no net increase in formal sector employment and a marked informalization of employment uh, in formal sector activities. Most tellingly, I think, for our discussions here, is the point which, um, which Mona uh, referred to in passing uh, this morning. By the time of the national election last year, according to Santosh Merotra's uh, calculations, about 100 million of those aged between 15 and 29 in the country were not, they were NEETs. They were not in, edu in employment, education, or training. It's an incredible figure. Kalyan Sanyal's argument that India's economy is characterized by labor exclusion what he's saying is that a very large share of the labor force is actually outside the circuits of capital accumulation. Seems to me in many ways very compelling. But I do think that he overstates the case because it's not that those in the vast range of informal activities, many of them uh, in self-employment, make no contribution to capital accumulation. By providing so many services so very cheaply, they reduce the costs of reproduction of the skilled professional uh, labor force. But they are themselves excluded from the most productive sectors of the economy. 
So capital in this country has sought two forms of labor, highly skilled professionals who are relatively few in number and vast numbers of informally employed workers. It's a situation which is very far away indeed from that in which the golden age of social mobility occurred in Britain. What are the chances for aspiring youth in a context like this? Even as I was writing those words last weekend, a post from an Indian website uh, came into my inbox. Wonderful. It was entitled, Hottest Job Trends for 2020. It informed me that a McKinsey report says that India is expected to generate 65 million specialized jobs by 2025. And it mentions the demand for specialists in such fields as blockchain development. You're nodding. You can tell me what blockchain development is uh, afterwards. In blockchain development, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity, and so on. It was a long list. Who is going to succeed in winning those sorts of jobs? And here the work of Anirudh Krishna, which some of you may know, is very informative. Uh, Krishna has noted that significant upward mobility in contemporary India is, by, is now, by, by and large, contingent upon or having or, or a college degree. The evidence now is, I gather, that wages increase significantly only after the attainment of at least secondary education, and that having, second, uh, having college education gives 15 times the gain of primary education. So which sorts of individuals, that is from what sorts of backgrounds, have been able to secure entry in particular into the, uh, the most sought after colleges? And Anirudh examined entry to engineering colleges and business colleges uh, across different quality tiers and also entry to the civil services, both at the elite level of the IAS and into two lower status cadres. He found that those from rural backgrounds are at an acute uh, disadvantage. Those who have attended rural schools and have parents in agriculture hardly make it at all into these more prestigious colleges. And those who are both rural and poor or rural and from SCST families, or those who are female with less well-educated parents, are all at a very severe disadvantage. The great majority of those who've gained entry uh, have relatively well-educated parents, fathers who themselves have college education and are in salaried positions, um, and mothers who have at least a high school education. SCs, STs, and Muslims are doing a bit better than they did in the past, but they're still very disadvantaged. Women have been doing relatively better at gaining access. English language proficiency is extremely important. That's been found in other studies to be seven times higher among urban compared to rural school children. The overwhelming conclusion is then that an urban professional elite is being reproduced and that socioeconomic disadvantage operates through the medium of soft skills, having information, aspiration, motivation, access to social networks and cultural capital. The thesis that entry uh, is gained as a result of inherent merit is challenged by Krishna's finding that the average class 10 scores are not significantly different across higher to lower ranked engineering colleges, and indeed that the highest average scores had been secured by students at the lowest ranked of those engineering colleges. The few exceptions, those from the disadvantaged, rural, poor, low caste backgrounds who have made it to the more sought-after colleges have had exceptional mentoring 
by individuals who've served as role models, imparting information, encouraging aspiration and motivation. And that, interestingly, is, was one of the very important findings of Oxford University's Young Lives Project, which has followed the lives of fairly large samples of youth in Andhra and in Ethiopia, Peru, and Vietnam since 2000. So it's now getting on for 20 years' worth of, uh, of data. But what then happens to poorer people in urban India? I follow Solomon Benjamin in seeing Indian cities as being divided between those parts that are the physical space of what Solly calls the corporate economies. That's in terms I was using earlier. That's the space of the dollar economy. And those spaces that are part of what he calls the local economies, which is where actually most people live in the rupee economy. Um, how much possibility is there of movement between these economies and their physical spaces. Our research in Bangalore, um, some of which I've been involved in, shows that there's no lack of aspiration in the slums of the local economies, which are occupied in Bangalore disproportionately by scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, by Muslims and uh, Christians as well. People in the slums in Bangalore invest quite heavily in education often in English medium schools, and in education for girls as well as for boys. Young people do have aspirations to enter the, prof or their parents have aspirations for them, you know, to enter the professions, become doctors, engineers, and so on, or to get into the salaria, get, get into government jobs. But the problem is that very few of them are actually then able to go on uh, to college. And there's no evidence from the studies of preparations uh, being made among them for entry into professional employment. That's an important observation because, of course, you know, you might say, well, the surveys, of course, the surveys miss out on all those people who've graduated from the slums to become doctors and engineers and, uh, and civil servants and so on. But the fact that there's nobody there now who's actively preparing to become a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer suggests that it isn't like, all that likely that there are very many in the past who've graduated into those sorts of uh, positions. So the result is that there isn't very much occupational mobility. Anirudh Krishna, again, from his study in Bangalore, comments that after three generations in the city, accompanied by rapid economic growth, slum men and women are working no longer primarily as carpenters or vegetable sellers, but instead as salespersons, drivers, security guards, shop assistants, and secretaries, the majority of the jobs being informal in nature and not highly paid. People have got a bit better off economically, though not by very much. There is, it seems to me, unquestionably, a, metaphorically, a wall between the upper part of the labor market and the lower part where the majority are employed. There's very little porosity, very little possibility for those who live in the local economies of the cities to enter into the other world the world of the corporate economy is what I characterize as the dollar economy. I've almost done. You're being very patient. Thank you. Um, summing it up, given the dualistic pattern of India's economic development, there hasn't been very much transformation of the class structure. Movement out of agriculture, to be sure, and some movement out of the rural economy, but then mostly into unskilled manual work. There's been no golden age of social mobility as a result of India's high rates of economic growth. There's been very little mobility at all in aggregate. To a very great extent, sons still fo follow their father's occupations. There is, as I was arguing a moment ago, a wall 
class inequality is reproduced by the hoarding of opportunity. Children of upper caste, urban professional parents, those with more practice, like us, in aspiration, are far, far more likely to secure jobs among those 65 million that McKinsey anticipates will be created in India over the next five years. And then, finally, though class is probably the principal determinant of mobility patterns, there's statistical evidence that upper castes are at an advantage, while rural people generally and scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, Muslims, are at a severe disadvantage and are also much more prone to steep declines in their class positions. So just at the last, and this is, I think, you know, I really want to sort of raise this, this as questions um, uh, rather than having very much to say about it. Is how do youth respond to the severe constraints that a majority experience in realizing aspirations? Elsewhere in the world, young people have been in the forefront of protest against existing political regimes and against neoliberal economic policy. Everyone here, I, I think, will probably recall that it was the suicide of a young man who was fairly well educated but working as a vegetable vendor and who'd experienced bad treatment at the hands of the police that prompted protest that led to the overthrow of the existing autocratic regime in Tunisia in 2011. And, and the, the Tunisian events then gave rise to the Arab Spring, a wave of movements uh, across the, the Arab world. Around the same time, there was what was called the Take Back the Square movement that started in the Plaza de Cinco de Mayo uh, in, uh, in, in Madrid and swept across Spain and, uh, and Portugal. 2011, too, there was the Occupy movement that started in Wall Street and spread to about 30 countries you know, the movement that claimed to stand for the 99% of us who are, less, who, who are worth less uh, than the top 1%. In 2013, there were the so-called June Days in Brazil, uh, a wave of massively supported protests against the expenditure of huge sums on football stadia and other sports arenas um, and in favor of greater expenditure on social services. All in all, in the 2010s, there were such revolutionary movements, as they were described by the sociologist Asaf, Asaf Bayat, in 70 or more countries. They were described as revolutionary because they were directed mainly at the reform of existing politics rather than at any sort of revolutionary change. In all of them, youth were in the forefront, um, and the research that we have shows that this reflected the deep frustrations that were felt by very many young people. What of India? Well, I think the Anna movement um, bears comparison with movements about the same time elsewhere in the world. Uh, and many young people, I think, were inspired initially by the rise of, of ARP and then contributed quite significantly to its electoral success. The concern for meaningful citizenship and for better uh, and responsive public services, such as ARP claims with some justification to have delivered in Delhi, was a fairly constant theme in all the protest movements across the world to which I referred. A number of ethnographic studies have shown that fairly large numbers of young people in India have turned to you know, more or less progressive social work. But I think it's clear that many more have found an outlet for their energies in more or less active support for the cause of Hindu nationalism. That support has been very assiduously courted by the ruling party and with success. Um, in the 2019 national elections, in spite of the failures of the NDA government to deliver opportunity, slightly higher, only slightly higher proportions of young people than those who are older um, voted for the BJP and its allies. As I said, the differences weren't great. 
only among Dalit youth and young Muslims and those from other minorities was there not, you know, demonstrated enthusiastic support for the ruling party, particularly because of its leader. It was striking that it was found that 50% uh, of young people who voted for the BJP considered job joblessness a somewhat serious problem, but having heard of the Balakot airstrike, voted for the ruling party uh, nonetheless. Nationalism trumped concerns about uh, unemployment prices and agrarian distress. Yeah, so I, I'm just really ending with questions about you know, what are the political responses of young people to what I see as, you know, the wall that confronts the prospects of mobility for so many um, who don't come from relatively privileged, in some way, relatively privileged backgrounds. What are the political responses of, um, of young people to to the, the frustrations that many must feel of their, of their aspirations. Well, you know, we heard very, you know, it's very interesting what, the, the, what Craig was saying yesterday evening, what came over in the film, um, is one very interesting sort of uh, response to the question I'm, I'm asking, that, that the prefigurative polit sort of po political, political action um, other, other young people uh, in some of the studies, I think, Mona, you were referring to, uh, to Nandini Guptu's work, for example, um, is describing uh, young people as, uh, as uh, having developed or having a, you know, taken on. Um, part of their habitus is, is pretty ex individualistic sort of... Uh, sort of attitudes, um, eschewing participation, you know, part of those shop assistants whom she studied, you know, eschewing any kind of participation uh, in, in, co in collective action. Um, where is there expression of voice? You know, um, expression of voice as a means, uh, Arjun Apadure argues of, of of developing the capacity to, to aspire and doing something about it. Where are there expressions of voice on the part of, of young, young people? I'm sorry, that was so long. I do apologize.